I'm really excited to see if how many people want to be part of this conversation. So at the VMRC, um, my job is to think about resiliency in the future. And, and to me, that means resiliency of our natural resources, but also resilience of the economy and the culture that was relied on our natural resources. And I think offshore wind is that perfect opportunity to right. So we can make um, a sustainable energy um, and economy based off of that while maintaining or even enhancing the, you know, the economy that we have. I think we have to use so the goal tonight is to make sure we have the data and the science we need to get us there. So I appreciate you coming. Um, just a few ground rules. We're, we're here to both share and listen tonight. And please remember to listen respectfully and with the intent to fully understand. There are no stupid ideas or stupid questions. I'm probably going to bring up a few that I may think are stupid, but I'm going to throw them up back anyway. Um, keep your statements focused on the meeting objectives or discussion topics for the agenda. I'll go get the agenda after I sit down and send it to you guys. Uh, and remember, we don't all have the same knowledge and backgrounds or the same training experience. So try to refrain from acronyms or industry jargon. Um, if there is one that you hear and you want to know, please speak up and ask so we're all looking at the same information. So thank you for coming. Um, I would like to just go around the room and make sure I have everyone introduce themselves. Just tell me, tell us where you're from, um, your name and the industry you work for. I'm Rick Robin from Virginia Beach. Um, I'm a staff and I'm in the fishery consulting business and the CPU export business. I'm Ron Larson, I'm a fisheries leader from the Employee Virginia Manager. Jerry Barnes, I'm a newly hired marine affairs manager for the Virginia Manager. Uh, Scott Lawton, I'm environment and permitting for the Virginia Manager. Andrew Fiala, I'm a fisheries economist for Virginia. Dave Rudders, Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And not uh, watermelon and water association. Sorry, I work for VMRC. Even though the LPAC here, I'm a speaker of the fisheries management team. So. And we'll watch you, North Carolina, for like a bunch of years. Oh, really? Thank you. North Carolina, I'm also part of the VMRC. Yeah, I'm a big Kevin Carroll, Dominion Energy, uh, Green uh, Operations and Navy, Green Screen, the standards are part of the Green Screen Project. Oh, one last uh, talk in SK Fisheries Coordinator here for the uh, Human Coast and Zone. Then I'm Emily Davis and I do mitigation and monitoring consulting for MGM executive energy. All right. Um, so then we're going to start with a quick presentation by Dominion Tech and Up on um, the uh, where they are in their process. Yes, please do. Okay. Can we uh, well, start? They are on the they are all able to unmute themselves. Okay. So I don't know if you want to do it in, in order. Yeah, but you want to name them out? Well, one is a phone number. The first one's a phone number. Um, sign was 804. Is 804 there to introduce you to yourself? So, oh, Hi, this right. is Laura Kay with the Virginia CZM program. Thanks for coming. All I can do is three things. Next is Alicia. Alicia, can you introduce yourself? Hi, this is Alicia Nelson with the Virginia Marine Resources Commission. I'm with the Fisheries Division. I heard Brian Dresser. Brian? Hey, everybody. Brian Dresser with Tetra Tech. Um, we're a consultant supporting Dominion on this project. Brian. James Huggins. James? Uh, yeah, J.C. Huggins, uh, Virginia Waterman's Association. Thanks for coming, Mr. Huggins. Jill Ramsey. Jill. Hi, everybody. Jill Ramsey, um, VMRC Fisheries Management. Um, John, I'm not going to just butcher that. John. Yes, no, you did a good job phonetically. This is John Swinnerton. I'm the, I'm the uh, manager of the uh, biology group at uh, Dominion. Okay, then we have Aaliyah, but she's not connected to audio yet. So we'll skip her and go to Lewis. 
Lewis. Hey, Rachel. Hey, Summers. Everyone else, I, I recognize some names mm -hmm. here. It's interesting. Thanks, Lewis. Then we have Lindy. Lindy. Hi, this is Lindy Hayes Sutton. I'm the executive director of the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance, or ROSA. Thanks. Good morning. We have S. Clark. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Susan Gonzalez, and um, I'm a biologist with Dominion Energy. And then we have Suzanne Music. Susanna. Um, and then Tom Dameron. Hi, everybody. Tom Dameron. I am uh, with Surfside Seafood Products. I'm government relations and fishery science liaison there. Um, thanks for thanks for having me on. We have a couple of people that have joined since. Would you like to go back? Sure, that'd be great. Okay, we have uh, somebody just CHR0449. CHR? <laughs> And then if not, we also have Laura McKay. Oh, that's a piece. Oh, right. Yep, I'm here. I just joined the WebEx too. <laughs> okay, got it. Then we're good. Okay, thanks. Good evening, everybody. First of all, Rachel, thank you for offering to host and uh, feel poorly that things didn't go well with power <laughs> in your building that had nothing to do with Dominion. <laughs> it had everything to do with the squirrel. I'm going to stand up here because I'm closer to the speaker. Uh, can I get a sound check from John Swinerton? Can you hear me clearly? Can anybody hear me clearly? You sound loud and clear to me. All right, thank you very much. All right, I know many of you have been through these presentations before. I know some of you have not. I'm going to try to go through this quickly so we can get to discussion. I'm going to start off by going through the slides. If you want to go back to a particular slide, I'm sure that it, the one that you're really going to want to go back to is probably for the new uh, turbine safing that uh, we just released. We'll be able to go back to that, but let's go to the first slide, please. So, Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Project, the pilot project, you can see highlighted in yellow right over there. The commercial project is going to be directly to the east of there. Two separate leases. The first is a research lease. It's held by the Virginia Department of Energy. The two turbines that are out there right now are actually performing very, very well. We've gone through an extensive uh, GNG campaign for the commercial project over the past year, and we'll be starting to go into construction. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go through the presentation. Next slide, please. So the pilot, two six megawatt wind turbine, 600 feet tall, 12 megawatt capacity. Supposed to be able to generate enough power for 3,000 homes. They actually overperformed for the first year. So they were in about 4,200 homes. They created enough electricity for. They're actually de rated seven megawatt turbines. So they did incredibly well. So for right now, with the two test turbines out there, offshore wind has worked. First uh, projects installed in federal waters, and we've been using these for numerous different studies. We've done drone studies, we've had ROVs out there. Uh, Bo and Brodia program is putting down acoustic monitoring buoys out there right now. We just deployed a floating LIDAR for weather observations. We're hopefully going to be putting that on a website soon so people will be able to access that real time, basically within an hour, weather data that we'll have out there. Next slide, please. All right, so for the pilot, just to give you an idea, and this will definitely be very close and similar to what we're looking at for the commercial project. This is what the foundation scalar protection looks like beneath the surface of the water. So you have that initial crushed rock layer is about 72 foot radius from the turbines themselves. Second layer is a heavier rock layer, 39 feet out. Armor layer consists of rocks about 800 to 400 pounds. We've done two visual surveys out there to this point with ROVs, and the marine life has been really basically off the charts. Lots of species, lots of different. Uh, um, fish that have been out there and the growth of the turbines has actually exceeded what our expectations were. Next slide, please. This just gives an idea. This is from the six month survey about what the conditions for the turbines look like. 
And there's just some representations for some of the species that have been observed on the ROV footage that we had out there. Right, next slide. So the commercial project, and I'm taking a very close look to that section to the right. This is what we originally intended for the turbine spacing. The offshore substations are not included in there, but those are going to be directly within the lanes, directly within the lanes, so they were not going to be in line with the turbines. And if you can see up towards the top left, towards the north west corner, we were going to have turbines right to the outer edge. Several different ocean users remarked to us that that was not the best. They would actually prefer, I think it was including the con fishermen said, that, hey, we actually worked that area quite a bit up there in the northwest corner. So if you could pull some stuff down, that would be appreciated. The triangle wrecks, we are not putting any turbines there. So this is what is originally intended. The numbers went from 220 to 188 to 180. Now we are intending to put 176. So we've brought those numbers down. The basic way we're able to do that is we're able to extract more energy out of an individual turbine to make up the, for the 2.6 gigawatts that we need to be able to accomplish for the Virginia Clean Economy Act. And that's about enough for 660,000 homes. The commercial turbines will be about 800 feet tall. Separation will be 0 0.75 to 0 0.93 nautical miles. So that's 93 nautical miles is just an over a statute mile. Once completed, it'll be the largest offshore wind project in the United States. So. The new turbine spacing, next slide, please. This is what we're looking at. If you look towards the top left, northwest corner, those yellow dots with the red circles around them, those will not be turbines. Those are now designated as spare positions if we have to use them. Our intention is not to have those turbines up to the northwest corner, partly for fishing, partly for deep draft ocean uh, traffic users. We're saying, look, from that approach, Parting the Chesapeake Bay, coming into the Chesapeake Bay, we would appreciate if we had a little bit more separation there. To the northeast corner, you'll see the same thing where we pulled some turbine positions away from that northeast corner as well. We are still not coming anywhere near the uh, triangle wrecks. And those central positions that you see right there, there's still those spare positions. There will be no turbines in that position. That is exactly what we are intending. And that is going to give a certain amount of area directly in the center. For search and rescue purposes, I've talked to Air Station Elizabeth City. They said that, that would actually be a good thing. Point of orientation, a point where they can actually turn in and make it an effective turn with the A60 aircraft. And also, this area will be open to navigation. The offshore substations, there'll be three of them. They are directly in line with the rest of the turbines. They will be, have, they'll have lateral separation, but they won't be on true cardinal heading. So, somebody moving through the lease area which you are absolutely permitted to do, will be able to be able to do that and make their clean transit through the area. The next slide will show you our inner array cables and the export cables. I know this, this looks absolutely confusing, uh, but so each one of the turbines has to be connected into one of the offshore substations. We'll be breaking it down into thirds. So one of the offshore substations will have the turbines running to that. It will come to export cables. There'll be nine export cables that will be coming ashore by the Virginia State Military Reservation. Next slide, please. So here's a little bit of specifics. I already talked about the 176 positions, 14 megawatt turbines. The foundations will be monopiles for the turbines, be jacketed for the offshore substations. Remember, there will be three. It'll be uh, 66 kV to 230 kV step up. The cables, the inner array cables, that's the cables that connect from the turbine to the offshore substation. It'll be about 300 miles, 7.9 inches in diameter, buried up to 9.8 feet beneath the seabed. Up to 9.8 feet beneath the seabed. Export cable will be nine of them again, about 417 miles, 11.4 inches in diameter, buried up to 16.4 feet beneath the seabed. So that's how far down we are going to. That is the max. Next slide, please. So beyond water timeline from what we're looking at. April to June, we kind of ran into the G&G campaign. I think we had some very good coordination, the people out working on the water. That's the commercial users, that's commercial fishermen, that's the recreational fishermen, that's anybody who is going to be in and around the lease area. We believe we had very good coordination, and that's exactly what we intend moving forward. Is that we anything that we need to do? This fall, we just deployed that net ocean buoy out there in the lease area. We were hoping to have that real-time weather data we're going to be sharing it with the National Weather Service, sharing it with the Coast Guard, 
sharing it with the public on our website so people could be able to get that weather data real time, basically within an hour uh, of, uh, of what the conditions are out there. The 2022 and 2023 predominantly will be doing USO surveys. So unexploded northern surveys will be out there working. We are going to put that out and we post our local notice to Mariner and also putting that on our website, coastaldawind.com. Late 21 to 2023, there can be some construction activities that are be out there just preparing the area and getting ready for the construction for the wind lease area. And then May to October 2024, that's when we'll start working on the monopile installations. November 2024, April 2025, construction for wind turbines and cable installation. Basically, all of this is we're looking to be complete and have the fully operational wind lease area in 2026. And that's when I'll be taking the keys over for the, from the construction team and working for the operations and maintenance side. Next slide. Okay. So for information, for anything that we have to do underwater, as far as surveys and stuff, we go through the Coast Guard local notice to Mariner. We're also putting that information on our website under the Mariner updates. And there's also a list of FAQs, why the location was chosen, how is Dominion Energy addressing navigational safety, EMFs, things such as that. So that is one of the locations that you can go to. Next slide, please. Or you can just get in touch with us. If there's specific questions that I think Ron has done a pretty good job of communicating individually with the Mariners, that's one of the reasons we really appreciate Rachel kind of blasting this out. We want to make sure that any mariner who works out there and fishes that area for commercial purposes has a voice in the process, that they understand what's going on. We believe that we can share this area. Absolutely. We could make offshore wind energy for the for this community. You guys can provide the community with, with fish and be able to everybody's going to be able to make a living out there. So um, this is I'm a senior structure project manager. I'm now actually operations and maintenance. There's Ron's information and Jerry Barnes is uh, new to the team. He just joined in November. He's going to be primarily the Marine Affairs Manager. So I know I went through that very fast. So what I'm going to do first is on the phone, if you have any questions or if you'd like me to go back to a slide, please uh, bring it up your uh, bring up your questions or your requests. Okay, hearing none in the room. Anybody, do you want to go back to the turbine spacing? Okay. No? Yes. And we will make these slides available to everybody who attended. Yeah. You did mention uh, up there space that you got there uh, lacking the few turbines towards the northwest corner. That, right. That was done in part for, for the call fishery. That small space you made? But that northwest corner up towards the top, from mm -hmm. what we understood from information I think we received from you, is that uh, the. You weren't up there last year, but it was some of the other guys that were fishing up there, and you saw a lot of gear up there last year. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that, that little space right there was. Hmm? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, it can be fished for a couple of days, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean the whole yeah. I mean just just to mention that that was done for the tall fisheries uh things, but uh that's that's not okay. That's not leaving the drop in the bucket. And you said something about the ship and lane. We know you're going to the ship and lane as well, but there's much time like you have. And so that's where the triangle wrecks so. are. The open spot? Yeah. 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 So the triangle wrecks are right. Yeah. yeah. That, so that's probably basically mostly why it was done other things. So there's still fish in the back. Maybe not from the benefit of the fish. That's not what it said. Okay. Because one thing we do is that sport fishing, you know, we won't we'll stay away from them, you know, give them their space. And, uh, they're all they're all there, but that's that's still not too much. There's a bit concerning that they're not going to be able to fish there once they're installed, or just during the construction of installed. Well, all of it. I mean, once it's installed, I mean, we um, I mean, we have a 
you know, like we were talking about, like we mentioned on one of the slides earlier, about the electromagnetic field. Who knows what that's going to do? I mean, our when we fish for is this far into the ground or further. And no one knows how exactly how deep a smooth call this though. No one's ever called them dredging. We know that they have to come out and and have a purpose to get in the pots, you know, to eat you want to eat. That's what brings them out. So we don't know how deep they are, and we're talking about burying the cables, you know, from anywhere from the right the surface to 16 feet down. That's our concern, because you know, the main concern after they're in for years to come. Not to mention what we want to say about burying I am just putting the platform on the ground in the upper hand. I think that expresses the importance of now for the pre construction surveys. That's why we have members from Vince here to start actually doing some extensive research in the area of exactly how much pulp is in that area right now. And how, how are they going to determine that? That's what we're hope that's okay. what we're here for. And that's that's because we want you to be a part of that process. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, the last thing I want to do is to is, is go into a study and then get to the end of it and you ask questions say, why did you do this? Why did you do that? We want right. the input from the fishermen about how we are going to get this thing done. Yeah. With well, that. I was just going to ask, so we already have just the two uh, research wind turbines that are out there right now? Yes. What What did you do prior to putting those down to check for the comps and stuff that are there? Did we do any surveying or kind of studies out there prior to installing them just to see what was there? Historically, anything actually wasn't with the project then, so I'll have to get back to you on that. What the, what they did for pre-construction survey? So you didn't ask to see what was maybe there. Maybe. So there were not pre-construction surveys done. So, so I just you know just from my perspective on this is that I mean I can't even put a I can't put an oyster pot you know above twelve inches in the bay, but you can put two turbines out there and not even know what's on the ground. Well, I mean, we did benthic surveys and uh, we did all the surveys that we needed. We just didn't do a specific comp based on survey. Surveys. How long have you been talking there? Uh, 25 years. 25 it was years. three months old when I started. And that's that's your historic area just below this triangle rex? Yeah, we, we've been, we've been, I was a few years migrating down to the triangle rex because I started working at a watch of bringing sugar to. But a buddy of mine was working shortly after I started, and he was like there every year. And I came down with him because he told me how the dump that this area was and what they have been. And it's, it's, I stayed down here for the past, I would say, for the past 15 years. I haven't been back up to watch policing because I'm satisfied with how, you know, the way this area, and part, partly in a big part, produces. So that seems like it's a good step to our next discussion. Is the, uh, the survey, what kind of questions should the survey be interested in? It sounds like the first one is what's there and how much is there and who's not Yeah, I mean, I mean, the only way to really find out, I mean, and then too, I mean, there's, we, we've talked about this before. Sometimes of the year, depending on, on, on te water temperature, barometric pressure, whatever determines what rods are called to on the feed at whatever time of year. But the way to determine it is the same way that we do it, it would be with a pot. And there's sometimes of the season, even if it's a good if it, if it's like the heart of pumpkin season, you might not catch them, you might not catch them in this area this week. But you'll come back next week, the week after that, and it's a whole different place. It's just like they they just fell out of the sky. It's just something drives them, and just because you put a pot there today and don't catch anything doesn't mean there's nothing there. So, so Tony, I think what you're getting at there like illustrates the point of having multiple seasons of surveys and having sure. you know frequent surveys going on there that really sort of obtain an accurate base because ultimately I think when we're kind of getting the cart in front of the horse a little bit with talking about sort of the turbine placements, you know, we have talked several times about really the concerns and the, the concern about how Minion has said and continues to say you can fish here. Here is compatible after the project. I don't think there's any argument with that. 
the question you're raising is regardless of location and placement of some of the you know, inner array tables, how that is there a physical change in detached post construction? I think the real focus is right now, I think is why Rachel's going to bring this back is, you know, how do you kind of get at that? And so, Tom, you just kind of nailed it. So, it's not going to be sort of an episodic, we're going to go out one time in six months, drop some boxes, and we're going to pull back. And I think getting that input is going to be really critical so that later, when we have some sort of process in place, and you say, you or TR, or, you know, or, you know, Tammy says, I am not catching like I was. And here are catch records that show the history of that. We need to see that. So I think that's going to be the real critical piece right now. And while I like the idea that we're talking about some of the inner array locations and sort of the micro siting going on, I think that's kind of out of the coordination of the conversation for us to really kind of get into. Focusing on now, I think you know, for 18 months, there's been requests to talk about monitoring and go out of finally getting to a point of using that work. So, yeah, it's some towers. I mean, so yeah. that's what I come back to. So, I mean, you know, in that context, I mean, you know, is that in your mind, then, Tommy, is, is that, you know, how many times a month in certain locations? And could you help us? And not just you, but well, I'm calling you out because you're, you're my friend, right? I can say to anybody, you know, um, what we're looking for is what are the key locations that we can drop the box? At what frequency to really kind of assess that, and then bring that back to our things team, and really kind of you know develop is that a feasible approach to get at what we're doing here? You know, because there are places that you're going to go to reliably, right? That's what we've always said to you. But the catching shorts no good. This is a reliable location. It's always there to make that count. Um, that's pretty. That, that really resonates. Why this is such a good one project site. Like, um, and so you have places, I'm sure, that, you know, each of you that are kind of your first hit spots. Uh, and I think that's going to be sort of, you know, the first swipe is let's look at seasonally in December and January, February, March, where you might hit in those spots and try and replicate your fishing activities in that time period to really kind of assess what that stock is out there. Do you think only pots, if we were to fill the survey, do you think pots would cover everything, or should there be other gears that we're making these pots as well? There's no other gear but the fish when it's pot. No. Okay. I mean, I mean, that, that yeah. I know of that any of us know about. I mean, people have tried dredges for years, different dredges, and I don't know of any of them that have been successful with all being able to make it efficient. We were, uh, we stayed at least more of that area. I think it was installed, but the first, uh, you had to go we get, and that gear moved three miles to get passed up into all those islands. And I think that's another thing that is something the surveys could, could look at are what are the potential losses to the fishery and how it would be compensated for if it happens. Um, that's data I think we would, that, you know, the researchers would need. Um, through you guys, so all of you fish tunnels within that area at certain at, at certain times. There's there's times of the year. This is not the only spot. This is one of our main go to spots. As Todd was saying, like when the water gets colder, we we always have to end up back there because we find it's warmer water. Mm -hmm. and that, not as big, but they all those spots are set this deep through the trail. It, it's okay. Let me interrupt real quick. So while we're talking well right now, primarily, I think what we do is we have representatives from other fisheries here in the with us. And I guess I'm sorry I was like walking and not talking to you. Um we also there there are other fisheries that are active here. And one that I'm really glad we've got Captain Jimmy Rule here to talk about some of the other active fisheries and history of fishing that's out there there are you know, there are there are squid mops that are out in this location. And then we, you know, we've recently been talking about you know, internally, um, there was a, quite a large catch, more than 2 million pounds of squid landed in Virginia just a few years ago. Um, and, 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 and talking with me, you know, I'm going to kind of toss you under the bus. Me said, you're the guy. And so I don't want us to get too focused. Clunk is certainly welcome as one. Black sea bass is one. Tom Barron's on the call, and we want to make sure we're talking about clam resources and those pre construction monitoring and how those clam surveys fit into those regional efforts going on. 
um, in the bigger picture play. I, I don't want to ignore that we've got other fisheries here um, as well. No, and, and we've met with Captain Hodgins for Black Sea Bass as well. Yeah. That's the intent of this is to make sure that we are speaking with anybody who's an affected fishery. The squid, if that's in our construction and operation plan, I don't know if we have any data that supports the squid, but that doesn't mean it has to happen. We'd like to see it. And for the surf plan, that didn't come in until August. Right. So that's I mean, that's why it's important that we stay connected and we continue to have these conversations because the historical baseline is going to be established only through the cooperation of fishing. Understanding that some cases are like, hey, this. This is my information. I don't want to just hand it over to the minute. So maybe we have to figure out a way. But that's going to give us a good historic background. So if you come and say, look, I've fished 90 percent of my catch comes from this wind race area. Like, okay. And if you have the background to show that, that's that's irrefutable. Now, if we go through with pre-construction surveys and that corroborates that, and we go through with post-monitoring surveys and that corroborates that too. So it's, a, it's an excellent point for for any species that has been, you know, I would say, you know, as far as the squid market, are those troll? I, I don't think we have any records of any trolling happening within the area since 2013. Well, no, right. since 2013, the whole ocean has changed drastically from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Right. For now, it's a different world. That's the problem I have when you look at historical land use. They don't tell you anything about what's going on right now and what's going to happen 10, 15, 20 years. It's a big problem. And with the exception of clams and, and conks, you, 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 um, the only way to do it is a trawl survey or acoustic survey. But two options. You can do a trawl survey that captures multi species of any kind that identify any of the squids, or you do an acoustical survey, which will probably be more useful once you get to a point where you actually construct it. Okay, so that could help, like, either say, look, the past history is actually now current history. It's happening right now. Or it's going to come back and say, no, nope, things are patently different. And these species aren't being fished here, but just because of that historical organization, correct? That's one way of looking at it. The other is that something always takes its place. That's what happens in the race. When one fish moves out, something else takes its place. Whether that's a marketable fish right now, we don't know. But it could be. That's the transition that's always happened. I went from doing a lot of macro herring fishing to broker fishing because the macro would not come down because the climate is broken into it. Right. Then in the situation reversed and the cycle changed on broker, then you ended up doing a lot of squid fishing. And, and markets changed too. So it's all in doubt. But I got a question for you regarding the presentation. The two turbines that are around have been going around a hundred times. I've not had a work around them at all because you could put pass and go on all cross squid or they come back. And I'm sure they doesn't reach out to those the longer we're going on. But do you have cables running to show up in them two minutes right now? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they've ever been notified. You've ever been notified where they were. They're charted. They're, they're, they're charted. They are charted. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're charted. They come ashore by the state military registration again, and they come to a substation over on Road. Is it two or one? There's one intro array that connects to the AO2 to AO1, and then one export cable that takes you back to the state military. Is it this one? How many times right now? There are areas that do have concrete pads on them, yes. And there are three communication cables that have to be crossed. So they have. Um, is, that, is that a potential in the upcoming construction? Those cables will have to be crossed as well, yes. Okay. So in that, in, there's a relatively small area of like this. Uh, I did have one for the next year. You gave me one like that. I don't even know how to do this. I mean, I've been checking the floor and monitoring and something like that. But with something like a back cam, being able to give you information on, on recruitment or anything, anything, anything other than the director fishing himself, being a business battle, which is more than a crowd. I'm wrong with the particular time of hours. I don't know how to go actually with the number of police stop. The way that I figured we'd do the assessment, and you know, I want to find out how many call are there, if there's any call there. The only way that I'm going to, of course, that I did would be the way to go and get the window in the fishing room, do it. 
We've all had our own. We've had a bunch of different pots. We've had big pots, small pots, tall pots, short pots, wire pots, wood pots, plastic pots. But we've all, we've all, these are big challenges. I was working with Sheep City here in Virginia Beach. Uh, different people up in Maryland that work at Sheep City, different places. We've all come to the same type of pot and our, by our own experience. So that would, of course, that would be uh, uh, the only way that I would know to find out what is there. Is it use the exact same type of pot that we use to do it? I mean, I don't know of any other way that that pot has been, uh, you know, bought now. I don't know if uh, even the clam bones that have been buried. Like no, I'm saying you don't have to. I think they bury so deep. The smooth pot, now the knob pot, you know, the knob wells is different. They have the knobs on them. They're not able to drill them to the bottom as far. So they can be caught by dredge. They've been caught for years with a with a uh, trawl with a Texas sweep. Um, caught on myself when I was trawling. Um, but the smooth fall drill so far to the bottom. I don't know if anyone really knows how far they go. But one thing we do know, they go far enough that no dredge that we know of has ever caught. Well, Thomas well, Reed or Oliver James, why do you share the put a GoPro down on an empty pond? And, you know, and, and you know, it was nothing. Then you banged it, and then you were able to watch them surface. That basically you showed me that the real was lost the pond surface, but that was fun. We had an area in the manager. We got in that area to go. We got the go for it. It was a lot of I still got it. Yeah. It looks like, looks like desert. The pond fell down. It was just like, just sand through, and there was nothing on the bottom. But, the calls were there. And so that gets to the point about using the half pin. And so well, that's the reason I would ask about the half pin. Yeah, I'm going to say. I see the reason. I know what I'm talking about. Right. But there's still spots so that we're only going to fish. You can only fish pumps up and past the surface. Thing. All the small ones are going to come out and pass about 40 miles. So how do you even tap your recruiter? If you have an issue with stock, you need to see the recruiter mode. Not Yes, it will be a certain to a certain extent, but you'll get to a certain point. Your water pressure will be a small, so I don't even want to punch on this matter. It's much cold. Before the action, we still have got anything to stay quite long with the behavior. I don't think we boil that pot, we need boil water. I don't want to say it's the water. To me, a pump pot pulls the easiest thing out. It's like if you load a load of crap like on a truck, a full of nine road. The wind gets in on me, it's hard to pull. They put it in a, you pull a box, trailer down the road, and you pull it in the box, you know, it's easy to pull. Anything that goes wind or work goes through, it's hard to pull. The bottom of the pot is, is I mean, much. Right. Yeah, but I mean, if, if you're looking to try to capture, say you're a few minutes, you can't do it, or at least you have to go one shell, or how small you have to go, but still be able to have your team, be able to get more information on it. To be able to monitor the equipment that levels. You know, that's 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 why I would actually have to run fast but yeah, if well, you have something that's moving that fast or moving that deep, you might not be able to pass it that way. But the the scrap area of that field is not that big. It would take a lot of time. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's all I And, and speaking of the cases throughout the island, that actually uh, there's interest from the all eastern states right now in that sort of conversation about how do we do, how do you come about some of these guys in the mouth from the, that time of the um, About how do we look at reconstruction monitoring? All the states are in the same sort of position as Virginia right now. We've got a project that we are about to go, and Welk and one of these are referred to as data form issues. 
uh, Wendy um, from Rosa gets on the call, and, and you've actually exchanged a few messages. I think you can hear me. I'm not interested in Rosa, being a balanced board of developers in the science community and uh, fishermen, are willing to help host that conversation with respect to solely that stock assessment question. How do we really get around it? So there are transferable, regionally um, valid information that anything produced that Massachusetts would um, produce as well. I don't think it's so important. I don't think we're going to have all the answers today, um, but there are some efforts regionally to go into the price for that. Um, but I think where Tom's going and the question's going, you know, how do we get a trap and catch the full range of size from little ones to big ones? Uh, so we can not just see the sort of market size, but the whole range of things. Kind of what I'm hearing. Uh, so. Anything I ever saw in the pot without filling up? Okay. And I'm assuming that the addition of the armor stone and even smaller stone may prevent them from changing. So I guess that would be the question. How does that going to change the fishery in the area? Oh, yeah. Even though the rest of the pot will leave room for the smaller calls to get out, a lot of calls don't want to. They're, they're, they're still they're in there for a reason. They're in there to eat. They're still eating. So we pulled the pot up. Well, they're still eating. They don't, you know, probably when they finished eating, the bait was gone. They would have left the pot. So the pots that we use, We'll catch, as Ken said, a wide range of calls. I mean, even the pretty, we call them peanuts. No, man. We're not going to get a four dirty. Excuse me. Hey, Jeff, team. Hold on a second, I'll let you. One of the high ones. And some games is two inches. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, could you get this uh, microphone a little closer to the uh, fisherman? It's hard to understand him. Uh, I'll try. Yeah. Maybe I'll ask. Maybe I'll just ask him to speak up. All right. Thank you. <laughs> could he yell a little louder? I need a translator. Plus, I'm just gonna ask Jeff. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll just respond to kind of the ask him question. Um, you know, most of my work is, is with the scallop fishery, and so the hat cam method was developed for scallops. Um, what it is, it's, it's a towed vehicle. It has a lot of different sensors on it, but the main one is stereo digital cameras. And so basically it does a great job of taking pictures of things that are on the surface. Um, and that's pretty much where the, 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 tech, the detectability comes. And so to me, I think that, you know, that's part of the conversation here is how do we work cooperatively with the industry to come up with the best way to monitor and assess the damage? So, you know, I think probably the wealth are a lot less developed in terms of their assessment and their analysis and their stock assessment than a lot of other species that you might deal with on VMAP or I might deal with scholars. And so, you know, I think we have to we have to kind of pull back a little bit and start with the basics, but also start with something that's well informed and also something that. Uh, is as Todd was saying, is, is potentially scalable up and down the coast to get um, you know, complementary signals from different sites. Well, so, so for one part, you know, Todd, you you told us that you are the representative of the conference. We're not going to use the word representative. So as legal company, I am the fisheries coordinator, and I help make sure that they are you know, fully informed. Okay, so, <laughs> so just are we communicating to them through you still? Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. So. From leaving here, what we would like to be able to do is, one, we can't do the study to the degree that we need to do without your assistance. So is that something that we want to participate? Sure. Okay. Yeah. And so I would say part of that, you know, and we've got our the, the BIMS team here is, is is being able to get a, a complete and accurate look at historically what you folks have been doing out there in the lease area in terms of the amount of fishing that you've done, how you've been fishing, and the catches that you've had. I don't even need to see it. All we need to go is get the ultimate the level of the data. In terms of moving forward, we want to be able to utilize 2022 and 2023 to the greatest extent that we can to hit those seasons like Todd talked about, where we're able to get deer in the water, but however that's going to be done, to get the most accurate assessment to be able to give us that baseline from historical data and the current surveys that we've done. So then we can start going into the construction period and do continuous surveys. And then afterwards, 
monitor after the life of the project has really it's, it's gone into full operation when we were starting to work generate power out there. We had the same conversation with Captain Hodge from Black Sea Bass. For what you're talking about, sir, absolutely. If there is historic, if we need to get a good thorough assessment of what's happening out there right now and not just be blind to what's out there historically, that's going to be part of the discussion too. And it goes right back to the Atlantic Surf Plan. There was nothing that we had within the top based upon historical data for Atlantic Surf Plan, but they're, they're out there now. And they were out there in August. And we've spoken with Tom Dameron. We've spoken with you, Todd, and uh, many topics from Rona. We understand that they're out there. So that is yet another point that we need to assess. Because again, if we're going to have balance between offshore wind and commercial fishermen, there has to be a certain level of, well, I'm not even going to say collaboration. It's just we're, we need to work towards the same thing. We need to understand what the impacts are going to be. If those impacts are good, then that's that's fantastic. If they are bad, then there's going to have to be discussions in regards to how. And say so when it comes down to mitigating and identifying areas where you know when we're out there doing our serving work, construction work, so we can all live and work in the same area, we're absolutely committed to that as well. And I, I think I'd be interested to see through your work, Jim, or anybody, are we comfortable sending the follow through? Um, as part what, of your what? maybe even with the two tests now, but I mean, at the point of first construction. Um, Are we comfortable with the fact that it's pushable? With what we have, uh, we have a fair amount of people to do it. So, of course, you have to do the exact same thing. The team's trying to set up a survey to tell you the Charleston impact in that area. Um, I think there's a couple of things that will actually, well, there's quite a few things that will get hit. One, I'm circle back around and talk about you know, surveying, you know, what the area, you make a snapshot of what the area is prior to construction. You need a, we can't. You need the entire ecology of the area. I mean, the monitoring survey from construction along you know, from construction phase onto the monitoring phase and down the road, it's an cause and effect survey. But you, you're not going to be able to encapsulate the, the, the effect if you don't know what it was prior to the start. Um, and one of the major issues that you're having is everything has gone 100 miles an hour with wind energy in the last few years that we. The science has caught up. I mean, there's quite a few survey uh, tools available. There's quite a few mass stuff. Um, there's a lot of things that are available that are already vetted tools. They're already established tools. And, you know, they're all of the information is quantifiable. Um, but we need to, it's going to take everything. It's going to take every tool in the box to, to actually sample these areas in the way that they need to be sampled to be able to come up with the main baseline. And if, if you're looking now, like 10 years, it's going to be. It's, it's, that's going to be the maximum amount of time we're going to get to survey an area. And from a biological standpoint, if you want to encapsulate change, encapsulate change, you actually need to have data going back to the entire, at least the entire life cycle of every species that's in that area. And that's not going to happen when you have you know, plans and start doing that kind of stuff. So two years, you're going to have to cram as much data in there as possible. Um, and then you're going to have to see how it changes over time. And the monitoring, you might from my standpoint is both what I do science wise and, and vision wise. It's not just a two or three years after the, you know, after the construction phase, we monitor and see what it was and that's it. The, the monitoring goes on for the entire life of the, of the farm because I don't know what the winners and losers are, but they're going to who actually are going to change the entire area. You're taking this area, which is primarily a transition area for most fish, most fin fish. And you're putting in resident species. You're going to build structure, so you're going to introduce structure oriented species. Now you have a resident population starting species. What does that do to the fish that used to migrate through it? What is that? I mean, it'd be great. It could, it could be horrible. We don't know, but you're not going to know unless it's monitored properly. You can't just monitoring is not going to give you enough information if you don't know where you start. Um, and it's clear. I mean, I, I apologize. I know I just mainly about you know, the swamp fish and the world fishery, and I don't know that much about it, but. It seems like there's not enough data. It's a data for species anyway, so this is a wonderful opportunity to try to put something together right out of the gate. So you get at least monitor it and couple it with lands and, and everything else. But as far as we're talking about the trawling aspect, I don't want to put it in. that's expensive. I already have. I mean, I've got something to be answered this way. I've done a lot of damn damage doing, but I was fishing, so it didn't matter. As far as surveying this, it's a piece of tape. But I wouldn't invest, and I'm not advocating for me doing anything of it at all. 
from the surveys from all of the wind farms up and down the coast, need to have a consistent standardized package. It's like a long term project of a small survey that's well designed, that's understandable for all aspects of it, that is standardized and consistent. The, the key word in, in the trawl survey is consistency. The package that we've got on our boat now, we've made 4,400 toes, 4,400 toes in 15 years. I have never in my life experienced a more steady trawl package. I've called times, and without catching pot, by the way. <laughs> Very seldom we see them. We do see them now and then. Surf plans once in a while, but they're everything that's collided with the Marshall we can catch. You call it smooth? Any amount of smooth calls? Now, no amount, but a few, right. but a few, but no amount. Right. But, you know, your experience of 25 years of doing this, and I know we have years because I've done the best I can to avoid it for years, but you've seen ups and downs in your fishing. You sure we do. fished areas where you know we can't fish this anymore. It's got to rebuild. This area right here sometimes is not produced at all. You it's it a wasteland. You cleaned it out. As as yeah, that. I know we have. Well, you reduced it. You reduced the abundance well, that we had. Then you come back and you take it. They come back and, 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 and back to uh, and back to you, you avoiding the pots. You maybe you've done good, but a lot of lot of your uh, friends haven't done so well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't get. I, I try to stay out of them, but I fought from you years ago on dogfish. When you first started dog fishing, out of Welsh Creek, I was married. I've never dog fished. You know, somebody did. But anyway, I've never done. It doesn't matter. One work week, one way or another. That's my goal. Uh, Tom Cameron from Surf Sites said they uh, would like to speak about planning. Tom, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I'd, I'd like to follow up on, on the point that was just being made about um, uh, consistent surveys up and down the coast. The, the surf clam and the ocean quahog industries are, are in the situation where we have, we have resources in just about every wind lease area um, on, the, on the eastern seaboard. Um, there's, there's a surf clam and ocean quahog fishery monitoring framework that is that is now being worked on and and we're we're, we're working on that in in conjunction with the uh, federal survey mitigation folks so that so that we can we can kill two birds with one stone here we we can we can uh, appropriately survey the wind energy areas and we can we can do it in a manner that that, that information from each one of the wind energy areas can feed back into the 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 federal survey so that uh, um, so that each one of these areas isn't isn't considered a big goose egg as as far as the the biomass that's in there if 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 the survey vessels are are unable unable to get in there um, so would it would it be Rachel with Virginia would would you want to be, would you want to be clued in on on those conversations and 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 how that uh, um, how that is is going? We've 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 got you know New New Jersey DEP is uh, is very interested in in this uh, uh, consistent um, uh, approach as it is. Uh, New York and and also the uh, the wind developers up off of uh, up off of of New Jersey seem to be seem to be um, a, approve of this approach. Yeah, I, is this a framework that we could maybe start utilizing this year? That we could set set our scientists up with you guys to make sure that if we start as soon as possible, we're using that framework. So there, there have been there have been uh, survey and monitoring um, uh, plans that uh, that have been developed that 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 do comply with this framework, um, but the but but the framework is not is not completed. So we're we're kind of we're kind of uh, we're kind of backing out the framework from from something that's already been done for the. Uh, for the ocean wind, um, for the ocean wind one area off of off of New Jersey, uh, 
we have conversations with the with the NOAA survey mitigation uh, folks here in the in the near future. Um, uh, before having those conversations, I I wouldn't want to say how how soon this will um, how soon this framework will be available, but I I do want to give you a heads up that it it is being worked on the the surf claim and ocean co oil industry is is going to request that um, um, you know the developers uh, use a a consistent framework so that. So that the the data is is collected in in such a manner that you know everybody's everybody's using feet everybody's using um, you know when they're when they're reporting their position they're they're doing doing it in a consistent manner so that uh, um, so that this data can can be made made useful by by the the largest number of folks. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, of course, would like to be part of that conversation, but also perhaps we can just start tying the researchers, whoever they may be at the time, into that. So as we're building, since we're building so soon, we can try and build that, those surveys as consistent with, with those conversations as possible. Robin, this is Ron Larkin. If you're working with uh, the other uh, the developers up north, it's certainly to the need as well. And and who are who are the researchers for for Dominion that that would that would benefit from from being part of the conversation? Um, I think right now it's uh, just the point you can include me, Tom, and and maybe um, uh, Jerry Barnes, um, and then we'll make sure it gets to the right people within the Dominion organization and make those connections. So it sounds like we have some some takeaways here. You know, we want to standardize as much as possible. Sounds like we have a few fisheries that we can definitely standardize for, and that's, that's trawl research in general. We have um, at least the start of cohog and, and clone um, surveys that we can latch on to make sure we're standardized. And then we have to start from the beginning for comp and start building our own research there. Um, black sea bass. And oh, thank you. And black sea bass. Well, as far as sea bass goes, we should be able to tie in. The endless crap surveys, the you know, hard bottom long lines. So that's what I was, I was trying to get at earlier. These, these techniques and surveys exist. The time series are, is already there. It's all you, all, what you do is expand them to a different area. So, like for NEMAP, we just ask you, hey, make sure you're. Make sure it, you're even if it's not necessarily NEMAP. I mean, right. NEMAP and the Science Center trawl survey are the same protocol. They look at the day from the rock opportunity versus the rock hole and the flat speed. But either way, the, to me, the, one of the worst things you can do is have every developer in every lease area come up with their own survey technique, and it services the need of that area as far as checking the box that the bone requested, or which apparently they're not, they're not even requesting, um, as, and then not be able to go any further. I would rather have it so everybody's using the same methods, we're using the same protocols, collecting the same data, so at the end of it, you can take all of it and compile it with existing data sources. For one, you can increase your time series beyond the two years that you would have you started today, going back to the initial time series of both VMAP and below 15 years now. So you actually have better, it might not be 100% clear picture, but you have a picture for a baseline. But you can also look at it at whatever resolution that you want. If you want to look at just this microcosm of ocean wind one, you can zoom in and look at it at that resolution. If you want to back out and look at it coast-wide, you can zoom out and look at it coast-wide. All of the information is cohesive with each other and it all sub, you know, it supplements each other as opposed to just being a one off, which is doesn't really service the needs of anybody. So I've heard that there's there's the ventless trap. What else are other surveys that are ongoing that we have? Hard bottom line. Just the south of this is also seven Chevron attempts, CMAP, and then the CMAS to take an hour to move the vehicles. And they actually put video things on top of the pages. You know, 60 degrees, so we can actually you have a path. They also read the great lights that come in the UI increments. So, about thousands of hours of video, but there's another option putting videos in front of these paths. Okay, they're in, they're already in its climate stream. It's in yeah. based climate stream. Right? You can basically we'll be taking that survey and expanding it to these days. Do we think we can get all of those things done in the next two years? I imagine it's, it's, I mean, yes, if, you, if it's pushed because you're not building the survey. 
you might have to come up with some application and have it implemented in the area, but as far as building the actual survey, it's built. We're just taking the information and moving it from one column to the next. So, Rachel, I'm understanding your question. Yeah. You say, since we have a lot of these surveys that are the way, except for the well surveys, I think my question is, when we initiate the surveys as soon as possible, how long can it really take for us to develop and initiate specifically the well fishery? That time ago, you guys fished all winter months. And so that's we're we're approaching them at rocket speed. Here it is November 18th. Um, trying to get to not miss it the first season so that so that we have more than one season of wealth monitoring on the curve. And so that it's not just can we get them done into here, can we develop the undeveloped surveys in a timely manner to allow us to be on the water surveying this year. This the ball say this is season. I'll wait for it this year because I don't think it's going to be possible. When it when would you ideally start? Well, yeah. I mean, it started. It started. Yeah. They just said. They just said that. When did the end of your season? When when did the season? Another nature decides at the lot of time. Yeah. If, if, if it stays the mild winter, whatever, we'll work right into the spring, right through the winter, right into the spring, March, even into April. But we've also seen it in January the first. Yeah. Right at the beginning of the year. Oh. Kind of two years on hold, I suppose, like most like a big that's what we've had two years. Is there would there be an issue for Dominion to use for what is there a boat issue or any issue that would prevent commercial fishing from helping? No, encourage it. Okay. I think the only thing I would say about that is that you know the consistency that Jimmy said about it. You know, you have to make sure everyone's consistent. You know, you can't have somebody who's in a slightly different gear. Yeah. Ideally, it would be everybody using the same gear, fishing in the same way. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of factors involved. The more, more, you know, more variables you have in there, the less likely it is. The less like, the less confidence, exactly, the less confidence is going to be in that data. So that's where a lot of the problem is. There's some of the issues lying in there. I'm sure. Vins and BMRC could put our heads together with other people on this well community that we have to come up with a great so It's going to make sure we do it consistently in the same data, you know, which may mean some days you go out there. I know I'm not going to catch anything here, but we got to go sample that area because we got to know the zero is just as important in some way. So those are some of the things we got to look at. Right now. The consistency with that is just as important for what's watching. So let me, so Ken, we were quick to answer that question. Yes, the fishermen are doing well for that. So I'm going to go one step further. The fishermen are going to be conducting some sort of well survey where they're not going to be really taking that cap. I mean, it's a monthly capture. There's time, there's effort. Will there be a process in place where they can be compensated for their time and involvement in there? These guys think they're live and good at And so I think, you know, while I'm glad you're saying yes, we want to involve, I think a strong consideration is to do. Yeah, I'll think okay. Yeah, it goes without saying. Yeah, they're going to be seen. Well, I want to make sure you're saying something such as that, but that is, that, that's certainly the okay. challenge. I think, I think, uh, you know, we've been fortunate to make it into so long. Yeah, Jim, you Yes, this season was going to be built. We've got 2022, and then we've got 2023. The structure doesn't start until what? Right. The other thing that's going to be a major, major point in that is going to be the academic partner that you need. The fishermen, I mean, I've, I've learned firsthand the hard way that it's a long time to take any double miles, which is anything that we know. But we can't quantify it. So we would just, you know how people can't vary. But if you don't have the science where they actually prove that it's just say, um, anecdotal information, well, we don't know. Well, I'm kidding. But 
it take you can't use anecdotal information and let it carry any amount of weight in, in scientific fact. It just doesn't. But what I was getting at is depending on what type of your academic partner is. You have uh, I know ODU has they do a fair amount on the they do some. Um Ben's definitely does it all depends on the dedicated it, they're not gonna do it for it. So you have to have we have a number of memorandum of understanding with Ben's. Which which includes compensation and things that's right. I guess I definitely send you a copy. Well, I'm, I'm not that's not what I'm getting. I'm just saying that I mean you use Orsted and, and Ocean Mint One as, as an example. That's the one that I'm, I'm currently trying to have to deal with. That is a full scale project but unto itself. I mean to the point that it's created an entire it took a subdivision in the Rutgers and they created an entire field for it because this is a full multi year process. It's not a one off or a side project that this small group is doing. It's not like, you know, MRG and Ben's the long line and Chesnap, they do uh, straight bass. They do, you know, they do a bunch of different surveys throughout the year. This this is a whole new group of reference that's doing just this. So it's it's you're gonna have to have a fair amount of and not that you can get the buy-in, but you have to have the backing of an academic partner to in order to make it work. So it sounds like the question is, does Vince have the capacity to do all of this work? So, so we have some internal, I don't know if we've been for a while. We have some of these things. What a lot of people around this table don't understand, especially a big one, in order to make this project work, you have to have confidence in science. They have to have confidence in you, and you got to have confidence in them. And it's a learning experience for both of us. You're going to be able to teach them, they're going to be able to teach you. That's what makes a collaborative, collaborative project work. Uh, you've got the expertise. They don't. But if they don't encapsulate all of your knowledge the best they can and design a survey that has the potential to succeed, then you get into it. So <clears> you have to have we're, we're all willing to work with the scientists, but I'm just telling you the only way to do a caulk survey for smooth caulk is with a caulk box. I understand. There's no other way to do it. I catch right. fish with my call class, but I don't I wouldn't I wouldn't really suggest doing the whole survey on the fish with my call class. But I do. I'll catch a lot of fish sometimes. Take, take a one square back. one square mile area. How many how many spots do you need to, how many pots do you have to draw on that? So you can't you know what you need. They gotta have a design survey that says, okay, we're gonna put ten pots in there, you're fishing this many days. Sure. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's we're, what we're has to be what, yeah, we're not we're not. We, we're agreeing with everything that they're saying about we want to be part of the study. We'll, we'll welcome their people on the boat to go out and watch us work them. They can tell us where to put them. You know, we'll put the pots where they want. We'll, we'll even map it out before we go. Put this many pots here and we'll fish them in the same place every time we go. Yeah, yeah. 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 But the intent of the survey, where it's placed, how it's placed, who's placing it, is going to be a collaborative decision between the bids, vending, and the pitch. And that's holistically between all. Yeah. That goes for black sea bass, that goes for comp, that goes for surf plants, however, you know, or, or twin, or however it's going to work. We want to be able to have a fully comprehensive there. And I understand the timing is there, but we only have the time that we have. That's, that's what we have this time right now. So as far as kind of coming from here and moving out of here and getting to work, that's the that's the important part for me. So does Vince, do you feel like that time is enough to get all of these wishes yeah. checked off our list? I mean, I think there's there's definitely gonna be a spin-up period. And you know, to me, I, you know, Captain Will makes a great point about cost of research. I've been doing property research with style for about twenty five years. We make a thousand codes and we need to go from Virginia to the Hague. It doesn't work unless we work together. And so to me, the best part of this conversation today is, is kind of forming that bridge, creating that bridge. The technical details we can work out. How, how do we set up the gear? Where do we put the, where do we put the gear? How often do we sample? 
those are technical little details we can work out. We kind of have, uh, you know, a feel for how to design and experiment. But to me, the important thing about this conversation is, you know, we're getting a picture from the landscape of what's going on. You, know, you guys are going to work with us to come up with a good experiment to meet again. So I think I, I'm feeling the answer from you guys is yes. And certainly the answer from us is yes. We have a little bit of spin up time as we get a better feel for the landscape of kind of the scale of what fisheries are involved and the time scales of how we might need to design sample. Um, but as Andrew said, we have institutional uh, backing for we're, we're committing to win because, you know, it was a great comment. I think this to me, as I step back and kind of put on my, my academic hat, this is like the biggest ecological ex land experiment of our lifetimes on the continent of shelf. It is going to impact how we think about spatial planning on the shelf. It's going to impact the ecology all the way from Cape Cod all the way down to who knows how far south. So are we prepared to think about that in a holistic manner? I think that's one scale. We're right now we're kind of a little bit more narrowly focused. That focus can get broader. We're thinking about how we standardize across sites, how we standardize across uh, projects. That's important. You know, I think right now to me, the big first hurdle was getting over what's important for this project. How can we move forward and think about it more broadly as we go? Um, I think that the model for most of the things in the shallow research all surveys came to us. Yep, that's, I mean, the half game was developed. Um, yes, the sir. Group, and it was developed a lot of things. So the point I offer that, I mean, you know, considering that the other states in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, South Carolina, or whatever it may be, different states that count them to initiate as well, my comes to the fisheries management for all the We really see a lot of this. Virginia's going to be the best way to the Senate as well. First, it's really going to help those fan efforts, and we can lead them on to create an opportunity for us to be sort of a test case. And that is, uh, I think, it would be, you know, if, if the survey technology approach, we're looking for consistency, and this is the approach that we're looking for here, but we go to that same process for the um, you know, same years, so same And so I'm hoping that uh, we can help kind of be the catalyst for the greater ecosystem assessment for specifically one data for fishery um, in this one. And, and that's, I guess, where I think it's kind of interesting is to say, well, there's good technologies come out through that research that we can call up. This is going to advance each case assessment of how we look at fisheries first for well. You know, that's what it's going to be. Now, here's the real challenge is we need to get this done yesterday. You know, I know we've been trying to have this meeting, but the fishing community has been asking for this meeting for 18 months. Uh, you know, lab work happens this year. But this is definitely something we need to kind of step on the scheme to hold with. So I'm going to do all I can. Put me in your butt. <laughs> and we have a water. water. That's okay. Yeah. I heard you say, like, the survey needs to be random. You can't just take your hot spots, right? You know, you know. I, I think you, you take both. You got to yeah, I know you take both. You know, I'm going by the crab red survey. You know how that's that? I don't think it's a good way to survey, but that's my opinion. But like, I know this. I know this past winter, they didn't. I think a computer randomly takes these sites all over, and they didn't even have no surveys. On sites where the crab usually bury all the time, we call it 36, but 42, the number 42 down the channel, there's always crab down. And I know a guy that said they did not work, they didn't even have no sites down. So we can't get a a true reading if you, and now I'm like taunting a computer with the pick these spots that we probably out got. And what if the spots that the computer picked at that certain time was on a hill? Bonks is on a hill one time, you move your gear there, boom, you're dying back in your valley. You know, what if I think, like he said, it's going to be hard to do to get a correct survey in a short amount of time because bonks is so hard to figure out if they're, they're up, they're down. Or, well, like Dave said, those are the details of the year. Yeah, I, mean, I think we need input. I know, like, like, crab, like they, I think you remember they had four, four crab brothers. To help with beams on a survey four or five years ago. You remember that, Rick? Um, yeah. There was two boat, two, uh, one from home, one from Eastern Shore, two from the Western Shore. And all of them said, Well, you can't pick your hot spots. We know you know where to go at to hit the crab. But 
I've seen where the prior drug surveys go and no one there no prior dire. So got to really take I know you can't take all of our info, but we're about to have a lot of say in the you know, where are you gonna set pods and it's got to be done just because we think they're gonna be there. They might not be there, but our a change in temperature that could be there like the next time. So it's got to be done with some lanes and to make sure. Survey, we need to have a, a we need a, a prior build based on survey, we need a construction survey, we need models. But we have roads that we have road, we have all these different boards and different ways of looking at it. But I think what's I think what a better way may be is ASMFC actually is NEMAP falls under ASMFC. The NEMAP is not just a survey that we do, it's the entire umbrella of the survey. So, but I think if we were to use NEMAP protocols for all for the existing surveys and move them and move them into wind, then either have you know, reconstitute the uh, the NEMAP board. I think it's still there. It's still have meetings. Then that's a way to have wind, you know, wind representatives. You have science representatives, and you have ASMC all at the table. So at least every state knows what another state is doing. That way, everybody's following suit. And you're saying, no, we're doing this, this, and this. I mean, it doesn't have to be the same timelines, but at least that way, all of the I's are being dotted and all the T's are being crossed in the same way, as opposed to the normal way of doing business, which is I have no clue what these guys do, and I don't care. I think that's part of the problem. Like, what is the, what is the, the hammer that's going to make all the, you know, up and down the coast to the system? And I don't think there is. There is. And that's the problem. Well, that's. And, and I mean, ASMSC, maybe I'm a commissioner for ASMSC, so it could be they're kind of looking, they're kind of looking on the outside right now, looking at you know, wind power, saying, well, it's going to be on our balcony. So, um, you know, and I, and I was thinking the same thing who, who should be the entity that decides that this is how it's going to be done? You know, all the, if there's going to be a trial circuit done for all these wind projects up and down the coast, who's going to, who's going to make the decision on how it's done? Just keep voice all out. Well, speaking of which, you know, the terms come up several times here compensation. You need to understand that up north, compensation means what are you going to pay me to never fish there again? Down here, it's compensation. What is it going to cost? What do you pay me to do what we want done? It's to protect our fish. That's two different interpretations. But I'm telling you, it's a big deal. Up north, all they want to say is, okay, for this many boats, we put us out of business, take this many million dollars. Look at Woods Hole. They said it would take a billion dollars to compensate them for not doing a survey that they can't do right to start with. But that's what they want a billion, not a million, a billion. Okay? So compensation is a word that needs to be clarified. When you're talking about a partnership, cooperative private research with the industry, then they have to be compensated for their time and energy to do it, not for what they're going to lose down the road. It's two different things, but I'm telling you, North North, this is a big problem. You said that, Jimmy, that's a great point. I'm really glad you bring it because you're right. That is two distinct things, and 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 that's why I was hoping that we actually don't get into a big discussion about displacement compensation because we don't know what that looks like, right? But but one of the things that I think that I can share and and, and Rachel, you're not going to be able to steal your thunder, you're still my thunder, we can go you know, sky five or whatever. Nine states, Virginia included, to the Northeast, have signed a letter to the law. First started with a letter to the White House in this new administration outlining bullets of how the states all engage support wind. But one of the bullets in there was how they support their fisheries. 
that that final number five bullet has resulted in a letter going to Boeing indicating the intent to develop a nationally managed compensation program for displacement for the post and, and where is it? It's totally right now hypothetical and it's in a 30, 50,000 foot elevation of concept right now. But the idea is that it begins to change the dialogue of how fishermen communicate with losses, how those are discussed. And, and I think that's also why, well, you know, we have that as a topic on the agenda. It's something I think that can quickly derail a conversation uh, because we don't know what that answer is. And and, and I think it's it's why we why I feel so out of there. We need to continue getting into okay, what are our tangible steps right now? You know, do we need a proposal from this? You know, how do we include the Northeast Fisheries Science Center in the MIPS in the design and approval of the methods of how we're going to do this? You know, I think exactly you know, about your point of how are we tying it into a regional NEA map, can they expand NEA map and those surveys in that board to oversee that? I, I think I'm hearing what I want to make sure we're going to walk out today because we've gone through a lot of discussions we've never gotten to this point. Is tangible next steps. How do we now move this ball forward from this room so we don't come back in six weeks and say, hey, here's an update from the NEA and hey, we're going to express the concerns we think we can get. Um, and so that's why I kind of want to make sure that our next step really is going to be, you know, let, let's let's shit or get off the pot. Yeah, let's do you want to, let's go ahead and start about the next steps. I think that the next step would be having a meeting to research leaders and fishermen for building these surveys. Yeah, I'd also like to follow the last minute and say about the case. The challenge that I saw in that when we talked about before my door really was that was a very broad overall conversation. And this is what I'm glad we have to do. So on, on a monthly basis, I meet with fisheries managers up and down the coast, the north of the north, and then with respect to the end. And so the idea of how are we going to make likes of that is how this sort of cross reference into to my conversation with the next few days. Folks are very motivated too, and so the February time frame they also get squirrely and they want to have something sooner so they can buy and have some results sooner. That was the point of the of the fog was, yeah, that's February. Yeah, to revisit, we got to we need to test you. So, would the next step be trying to get all of those groups together to get up and reach things about whatever whatever information comes out of that? Okay, can you use that thing? I think. You can be in the survey that comes out of the uh, it's been many words on the contact with you. I think that's a medical comment, Ben. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's a good idea. I understand you say you have a letter of other left stand with Ben's. Ben, the meeting does. Well, then, Dave, to your point, these guys are concerned about something that's been prepared today. I've heard a lot of things about that. What I would suggest is that our survey is stratified random. In other words, I got a box one mile wide and one and a half miles long that I got told. That's when you apply your knowledge. You need to provide them a 500 foot area to set that box. Not a not a pinpoint right there. Give them 500 foot, let them use their expertise to say, well, if you move it here, this is where it should be this time of year, move it here this time. When I'm looking at 
a station that I got to do a mile, mile, say what mile, one mile. I'll look for swivel. I'll look for settle. I'll look for something where fish are going to be. Because my job is to get a representative sample of what's there. When you can't do it, you're told by the fish, you know the fish might be big. So you should not be made to set a pot where you know it won't catch. But you've got to put it in the same place next time, too. So this is this is where the cooperative collaborative comes in. You know, the expertise of the fishermen is utilized, but it's utilized in a manner that conforms to the requirements that we've designed. So give, you know, give them a little leeway. They've got to be able to use their ability to get us installed. And then they've got to be competing. They're not going to send right exactly the same spot, but as close as you can. You got to do your part, but you got to have them on board. I do want to know. It's a good lesson, I guess, for the menu. Something that happened two months ago, with course, and it's it's really got to do with. I mean, you've done a good job. You have to be on to work with the industry, but you also need to have liaisons from the, in, from your academic side that is also working with industry. Right before we started our survey, which goes from Cape Hatteras all the way to Mark Linder, Horstead put out a race. Horstead and Stony Brook put out a few arrays. I think it was what, 14 arrays from no more than that. 14 lots. Yeah. 28 arrays from let's see, let's, from uh, New York, get the armor and some to Andrew right off the beach. Didn't tell anybody. Didn't tell anybody where they were. And these areas fished a lot. And there was a lot of right out of the gate. There was a lot of interaction with the gear. Um, there was a lot of damage done. It took a, a way significant amount of pressure, way more than it should have, to get the information on where these arrays were actually placed before we could start the survey. And they were actually in our areas. They were in our strategy. And we actually, it actually, the information came from Doug Christian. No. Is there a strategy or a place where you could just. It wasn't in. Yeah, it was, hey, this is yours. You want it back? It's very expensive. So you're most likely to just keep that going. No, and everybody else. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a very large conversation, but everybody needs to be on the same page. I, mean, I, I would imagine these acoustic arrays are very expensive, and I'm not sure that it is one of how much five grand from small arrays in five years. But but you, they're putting that bunch of stuff in right. yeah. and, and you don't want to own them if it does destroy them, destroy them. You don't know why it's, it's a lose lose. But believe it or not, it was not. Once they were made aware that they were out there, they just said they were in this area. They, it took two weeks before we actually had pinpointing and what actually came out was the numbers of where they were supposed to be. We did, but a lot of the other guys didn't. And that was just because of lack of, lack of communication from the academic side. Of that had nothing to do with it. They paid Stony Brook and um, I think it was all Stony Brook. I mean, that seems like a good, not that basically the number of studies the best way to be, but it seems like it's a good latch into making sure that everything is going on that we're managing that goes on the website comes to us. And so we did a series of on the pilot project, a series of, uh, <laughs> of mariner updates. So as we were going to start a survey, or if we were going to put the wing buoy out there, whatever it was, we would also put it on our website, but then Ron would blast it to everyone who's there. The last so, thing you want to use is most the mariners. The first thing you want to use is fishery day. Well, understood. <laughs> <laughs> there are things we have to do. Uh, they're all torn. Yeah, they're just covering off butt. And, and so that's what we need to So, like, if you have suggestions on a contact or a way that's better, we, we, we'll take the feedback and you know, we'll do what we need to do. Because last thing we want to do is a tangle up our gear or tangle up your gear. And because now you're off on the back, you know, it's just a heavy stone. So, I mean, you already have. You know, don't, don't we want to say what you think? Except for you need to make sure that you have you guys communicating with each other so that you just want to be. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're through Ron. So, um, I mean, he's going to be. I talk to him all the time. Spoiler alert. He's going to be in my seat. He has a way to press the chest big, big, big. On the record, I'm not allowed to do it. No, he's going to press the big stuff. So, if you want the coordinates, we'll give you seats. We don't want them there. But there are our arrays and our buoys that that that's not that you don't make it around because it's only just a few per box style right now. But but in that token, it's about listening to what you put yeah, out. Yeah, I'm sure you think so. So it's are, but it just didn't work. Yep. So the other the other best buildings have been out there for, for considering. And that'll be removed shortly. Sure. Right. Exactly. No, we can the, the mini plan will really be glad what tool. Yeah. 
that's not a yes. You're saying yes? No, 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 we're, we're not. So Jeff Dean has his hand up. Jeff, do you have something to comment? Yeah, on this slide, if you follow the track of turbines north, it is tracking the text. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Can you say that one more time? Yeah, if you if you follow a line of turbines to the north, the text to the left, is that true north or is it magnetic north? No, yeah, it, it, they're not on cardinal headings. They're, they're specifically spaced that way uh, to reduce weight effect. So they, they are, their lateral separation in most parts from them, but they're not on cardinal headings at all. They seem pretty standardized. I was thinking for safety's sake, navigating through and for weather, and it'd be better if we knew the, the course, but just a suggestion. Yeah, it's, it's a balance between being able to put them out there, being able to generate enough energy to wake up back and not have them also to be in terms of, like you said, for, for safety's sake for navigation. This, this is the balance that we have out there as far as the predominant wind directions and how they're going to reduce wake effect as opposed to the, the best way to generate the most energy, they'd be staggered all over the place. They would not be one really in back of another. They'd be just out there and it would be very, very difficult to navigate. This is the balance, again, that they're not on absolute cardinal headings, today, but there, there is the separation and there's the clean lanes, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to pull the offshore substations out of the uh, separation between the turbines and put them in the lane. Okay. Okay. So um, we're a little bit behind. Um, next up, so I heard that we're going to meet with the pump fishermen. Can we say about when? When is that happening? Okay. We can meet for how long? Can we say within the next three weeks? Yeah. For us. Yeah. 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 So, so the process of basically this is that uh, if, if any of the fishermen can't be there, um, they get um, extra fish in the spot. And then their involvement in that, they will always have, if they can't physically be at the point, the information can be brought back and be put in place. Just based on, they're not paid to be at our meetings all the time. So we'll just make sure that that's fine. May not always be as convenient, but they're transitioning to a business team. And we want to make sure that, that like today was a blow day, right? Those yeah. folks didn't go out. This season, like Tom did, was strictly a bad thing. Six days. Mm -hmm. Not that it didn't work, but Tom did a blow day, they had a good day, and how we had to get two or three days to be pretty good. The faster you tell her, are spinning out there. And then we have good fish trying to fish all on the same thing. I think most of us can be flexible. So if we see a blow day coming three or four days out, we can plan something. We can react pretty quickly to do that. So I, I know yep. I'm pretty good. Excited. Get excited. I'm going to look to, to, to David and to many of your thoughts on make sure I don't know how flexible they can be. I'm, I'm more flexible than what I'm actually doing. What class we can do that. Yeah. Yeah. We could definitely do that. You know, uh, on, 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 we can. Yeah, we can move around and then stop the car and say, hey, you know, Thursday coming up looks like you might have, you know, this Thursday, Friday this week, we're going to have all the 50 things that come up. The goal is to have it here in the water as close to the first of the year as possible. Right. That's, that's a key. Yeah. And then for it to satisfy our research on claims, um, the next step would be what? Speaking with the researchers that run the federal claim survey and seeing if we can. Yeah, I think I understand Tom. I think he's going to think about it. I think I know the reason. I think I know the research. If there is an existing survey that is out there already, what I don't want to do for any particular species is start doing something completely different that's not going to comport with whatever that's going on. So we're more than happy to start increasing the scope of an already existing survey to include our lease in. Okay, great. Um, so that would cover claims, and then we have a number of trawl surveys that are happening federally. Um, so 
trying to get in touch with those survey managers within three to four weeks. That's what I'm saying. I, maybe just back up for one second. I think you know, to me, to me, kind of a, a pretty reasonable trend of moving forward. You know, at, at least at kind of the state scale. Um, you know, we met with I think we can come together and, and come up with a proposal for a reasonable town for, for uh, to, to achieve the monetary goal. I think that's a good first step. And in terms of the coordination piece, and I, I don't have to put Mindy on the spot, but you know, I think every rose has kind of the center of the kind of a wheel. And um, because they have their finger on the pulse of what's going on across projects uh, up and down the coast um, better than I or I, I will speak for Andrew, but it's, it's 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 a lot of work to keep up with everything that's going on. Is it Wendy still on? Yes, yes. Wendy, I think you guys, this is the wrong project. Um, I think you were you guys having a, a project where you actually have a contact with putting together a database or assembling what's what's happening up and down the coast right now with the different surveys. Hey, Wendy, can you hear us? Yes. I got one person. Oh, yeah, right now, I mean, you're not person. Hey, this is Lynette. Could you repeat that? Yep. Uh, yeah, let me just run last. I was just asking about that. I think when we were chatting, you mentioned that there's a, um, you know, that you've got a contact with putting together a, uh, basically a database or, or a list, a uh, consolidated list of all the survey work that's going on up and down the coast so everybody understands what's happening and who's doing what. Um, sort of. So we have a contract with RPS that's looking at like the types of like generally the types of data that's collected more in the realm of how we improve kind of data sharing and data accessibility um we've tried a little bit with the um, some of the northern developers to get a better better sense of kind of what type of surveys they're doing and things like that um that's been a little bit difficult just because the the projects are all in different stages. So, you know, we were trying to get a sense of, you know, how many trawl surveys are going on, how many people are doing ventless traps and how how much variation there is in the survey design and things like that. That's been a little bit slow going, um, but we have been trying to pull that information together too. So, Lindy, do you think Rosa could assist us in some way of, of understanding, getting in touch with the people that are around or the surveys that are going so that we can try and be consistent here in a timely manner that's something that was like not yeah absolutely i think at the very least um you know we can help connect to the different projects you know we do know obviously the developers that are working on them you know are connected to us and then in some cases the researchers as well um so we could certainly help connect that for sure yes that you were about to ask that Dominion is not a member of Bro, so we recently just had a conversation with Lenny and Mike, and we're starting our relationship. Okay, I mean, it'd be great. I mean, right now, you guys are coming behind me, I'll be honest, you know, um, and it would be great to have Dominion actually be active with the student consumers uh, in those processes. I mean, obviously, you see the great benefits. This project has been doing it from the sort of groundbreaking, a lot of areas, obviously, you need to be able to all the way around. And so, yeah, that's why I can say. You know, whatever you guys could do to you know, kind of ratify that agreement and that table of them, I think it's really going to do it. Okay. Um, so we have our next steps. We avoided to minimization. Is that something you'd like to talk at a little later in the game? Uh, what's the next question that I have? Should we have another one of these meetings? Are you interested in coming to another meeting? Um, specifically to talk about things like avoidance and communication and how we started that conversation about what we are suspicioning and how can we make sure you're taking it. In terms of avoidance, when we did the G&G work and we're working with Tron and communicating about where our survey work was going to be, where you were going to be fishing, did that work? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if I mean, if we're going to have another meeting and we're going to lay out some plans on, on, to move forward. Sure, I mean, as long as it's beneficial to keep us moving forward, you know. What I would say is, as far as work that's going to be taking place out there, I would say outside of really the crew transport vessel delivery wind test, which that happens frequently. And that's just, you know, vessel to vessel communication. But if there's going to be survey work like the USO surveys, there's going to be things such as that. That is something that we will communicate as we're supposed to on local boats, parents, and, and then we'll also 
been on the website, but then it will be Ron communicating with you directly saying, hey, we're going to be in this area. I remember a couple of times last year where it was, I don't know which particular person you're working with, say we're going to be surveying up here that well, we're actually working that area. It would be better if we could do do a different part of the of the of the area, and if we could work that out, we'll work it out. So that was the last two years when we sat down and we had said you guys were very generous and said we'll wait. You guys can finish your survey in the northwest corner, and then you had said we can wait until the new year. Yeah, yeah, and, then yeah. that, and then that's all you guys were moving your way down and you know, do that. So. Yeah, I think what they're asking for is something similar along yeah. this. Sure, we work yeah. together. That, that's, work together on the center sure. yeah, And that, that's exactly yeah. what we're continuing to do with any, with any of the fishermen that are working within the lease area. We'll have that level of communication. That's why it's important to integrate. Thank you for it. I remember when we first got yeah. up in Cape Charles in October of 2020, we're like, all right, is this everything? We want to make sure that if there's someone else who's working in the lease area, whether they, you know they're they're working with Broder or not, if they're just independent with one another, we're talking, talking to them too. Because every, every fisherman out there that we want to make sure everybody's aware of the recent interaction that happened up north. That's the kind of crap I want to avoid. I don't want that. So if we say we're not going to be in a particular area for a particular period of time, we'll make it agreement. We're going to stand by. Right. And generally, the way do you all know how and then for avoidance minimization, my thoughts were more like, um, how do we make sure during construction we avoid where you guys are fishing? Um, are, are things set up in a way that is not on a particular, you know, um, area that is productive fishing spot? Um, post and during construction, how can we make sure you see a There's a way to move a resource, a non moving resource out of the road when we go to construction. I mean, those are the kind of questions that I think we should, we still need to talk about. I think those are very important. I mean, obviously, I, you know, we've got a good, I think, a good working model from the pilot project that's before you. But I think with the task we have in front of us in trying to get these surveys done, now we should be focusing on the surveys to get them going as soon as possible because as everyone said time is short agreed and I that's, think that's something we can you know talk yeah, about absolutely okay. but just i would i would table that okay up to a little bit great okay so like a, when is a good time to figure about another i would say let's get the gear moving and that would be between you know Based upon the bid schedule, based upon the fisherman schedule, the cost schedule, is making a determination. Okay, given the lease area, where are we going to put the gear? How, what type of gear is going to be placed? How often is it going to be, you know, fished? And who's going to do it? How are they going to get compensated for their time? How is the cash going to be quantified? How are we going to really collect the debt? And it also goes back to what has historically been happening. That, that, that we have past history where we have people have been working in the lease area where we could actually look back and say, okay, this these are the types of the years and these four years we finished, and that's could actually help them when we going forward. We can discuss that's all of those findings as well. Right, but I would say the next meeting, I don't think it needs to be, you know, that that would be something that would be well specific. Does that make sense? As far as a general meeting. In terms of inviting all fishermen from all affected species or all interests and stakeholders, what I would propose is, and I know people are just so sick of meeting, but I would say that we're willing to commit to a quarterly, just general project meeting where we get together, make ourselves available in a different location. It doesn't have to be here, it could be, you know, we could come up and do it in different areas. And that's outside of the research. Does that make sense? Whether that's a BMRC type of and I kind of like that idea. There's no reason why Justin Easton should have to come over here. Yeah. If the meeting's dealing with you know, what the folks that work there, they need the meeting to be able to. Yeah. I think the real challenge is you know, to get us to see that the big guy goes to Greenville or Blocky or Hill and here or Tate Charles. It's a shock. So, unfortunately, no place is going to be perfect. Um, so, everything's going to take some effort to get into the Hey, Kevin, I will say I think one thing we have gotten used to 
well, we can put them in there and we can see remote things and we can right. to help minimize that drive. Well, Tom is in Philadelphia. Tom is not going to drive four hours from being five hours. So I was told you that's something we need to remember about face to face is wonderful. We need to make sure that's in Right, I thought Rachel would have to the squirrel is sitting up at the location at the last minute. We had a little anxiety, but we got them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is so nice in the last place. Yeah, and, and I will say, Ben's is, is pretty well set up for remote meetings where we've got, we've got some pretty good technology to support that. So you know, I would offer that and talk to them. Yeah. A little bit out of the way for some folks, but. Yeah, we'll get through the holidays here. We'll see where we are. Any other concerns or anything else? Put everything off to let it close to you. Yes. We've accepted what's wrong with some strength of the tops. You know, which was fake pieces. I think all of it needs to get going as soon as possible. Some of it's going to be a lot harder to actually do it. You don't want to try to implement something too fast before you buy it. It needs to be reviewed. There are people One thing about home, too, it's not like we have anything prior that's going to stand in the way. Starting from ground zero, the cost, ours, there's nothing on the books. So it should be easy to start. I think what's also going to be important, though, is the way you're right, we're starting from ground zero. It's kind of a pre zero. A pre zero is basically using direct access to your efforts so yeah. before and trying to incorporate them so that you do have some sort of a baseline that we're trying to throttle it. So one thing to think about that I think we have to talk about, that's a great point, Bob, is that their data, their proprietary information is that the government has created fisheries knowledge for us to maybe something to consider about how we maintain conservation. Reality is still have access to those data um, so that that protects your information, right? I think it's worth exploring ways on the call. I can't quite hear it well, um, but it's something we should always consider is how we do data sharing. That's entirely up to you, how you share data. We do it goes to I don't need to see it. I just wouldn't be able to see ultimately the results. That's that's I, I completely understand how that is. We can sell a giant disclosure agreements. We can do whatever you want. Whatever's going to make you more comfortable at the end of the day. That's how the data will be traded. Okay. Any other concerns? Anything else? Okay. Um, phone. Any um, any last comments? Finish up the meeting. Hi, this is Lane. Um, just to speak to what Todd spoke about, um, I think we'll group together internally and figure out if there's any availability for the data trust to hold something like this, this kind of data. Um, it's funded on a project by project or like a fishery by fishery uh, basis. So we would have to think about that. Uh, secondly, uh, Tom Dameron is very good at joining webinars. So I'm sure he will be happy to jump on any virtual meeting um, related to uh, surf clam, ocean quahog uh, survey methodology. Um, and then I think I'm gonna follow up with you, Rachel, to connect you with him to talk about what the regional standards for those surveys, um, what it's what status they're at and all of that. But, okay. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Anybody else on the phone? Thank you guys all. This Really, we go out and looking forward to this, and I think hopefully we get a lot out of strength meeting. So, thank you guys for coming. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.